Hey everybody, welcome to today's live stream. Today we're going to be sketching animals, caricatures. Uh, it's not something that I actually have done a ton of, so I want to get it out there right away that I'm actually not an authoritative expert on teaching how to draw caricature animals. It's just something I've done in my work here and there. I've had to do it for clients, for private commissions. I've done actually a lot of pet sketches, like quick sketch style pet sketches for people over the years. But um, I mean, I've also had to illustrate them uh, as well for illustration jobs every now and then. And it's not a huge part of my career, but it is something that is good to know how to do and to get some comfort with because you never know when that may, you know, open up a whole new avenue of work for you one day. Um, I, uh, my experience with animal sketching, uh, like practicing it anyway, I took a class uh, at Watts School many years ago where we actually would uh, draw in the studio and study animal anatomy from books. And then the next week we'd go out to the zoo, the San Diego Zoo here, and uh, sketch them live, sketch the animals we actually studied the week before. So the... Uh, you know, the proportions and the, a bit of the anatomy was sort of fresh in our brains while we were sketching them live. Because when you sketch animals live at the zoo, they move around, they're not the best models, so you kind of have to do them quickly and improvise and rely a lot on your knowledge and your intuition about, uh, about how to fill in some of the missing information that you can't see. But I do recommend live animal sketching as much as possible. It's just, it's fantastic. It really gets you um, really, uh, you know, economical with your strokes. And when you're doing cartoons or caricatures of animals of any kind, it's, I think, really helpful to be real quick and economical with your brush strokes or your pencil strokes uh, to get that gesture in. And that's what you're going to see me focus on a lot here today is initially the gesture of the pose, which is, is the basis of everything, whether you're drawing humans or animals. It's the motion, you know, what it's, how it's standing, what its body mass is, you know, what it's, where its weight is. So that's something that's going to be a primary concern. And then, you know, the details come after that, but if it's built on a bad foundation it's not going to be a good sketch uh let's see who we got uh, talking or coming in here we got uh hey everybody welcome from holland keys uh lester well, hello hey drimrolt thanks for joining us again uh yeah uh Dimrault, i think you know being familiar with animal anatomy and sketching animals does definitely help in caricatures not just for that spirit animal caricature lesson that i taught in the proco course uh, but just, you know, to help loosen you up and think freely, you know, in, in novel ways about the human face and how you can make it maybe look more like an animal initially when building up the uh, initial concept. Hello from Uzbekistan. All right. Hey, Stan. Thanks for joining. Jeff. Akfire Art. Hello. Hey, Red. Thanks for joining in again. You'd like to try a caricature of Great White Shark. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that would be the fun one. I think Jason Seiler did, has done a lot of sketches of sharks. Him and Tom Flurdy are a good artist to look at for their sharks. Uh, hello from uh, India. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. And Kasim, hello again. Uh, from Iran. Oh, that's great. So Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope it's not a terrible late hour where you're at. I'm not even sure what time it would be there right now. Hey, Eric. Um, so, okay, let me go ahead and show, I've, I've got a few, just, I'll, I'll share some of my old sketchbook sketches with you here, um, to show you some of my, like, stuff that I did, like, down at the zoo. And these are actually were life drawings down at the zoo. It's, you know, sometimes they're not caricatured. In fact, mostly they're not, because I was there to actually try to learn how to draw animals properly. Uh, but I usually get a little antsy, you know, sitting at the uh, enclosure too long with the other artists, and I would just start caricaturing them. So I have a few where I did more simplistic caricatures. Uh, this one, this one might have been from a book. In fact, I think it might have been a study of another artist's work uh, when I was, we were studying big cats and lions. Uh, but it's definitely caricatured. Uh, this one was done from life, uh, I'm almost certain, uh, trying to capture the motion of the polar bears. Each of these was probably, you know, no more than four or five minutes. Um, I think one of them I sketched with some markers. These are actual real sketchbook sketches that I scanned too. They're not digital. Let's see here. Some, uh, you know, I find the hooved animals sort of the most boring to try to draw in caricature. Uh, but, but, you know, they've got some stuff going on. You know, I tried to caricature this zebra. Um, but, yeah, I was focusing sort of on the anatomy and the construction of the, of the animals, which is a fundamental thing. It's definitely something you need to be familiar with, you know, to figure out how the shoulder blade, you know, interacts with the torso and how the rear legs are shaped and what the bones are doing. 
Uh, all that stuff is really, really important with animals because they're, they are so different from humans. I mean, we're, we're similar. We've all got the same bones, essentially. They're just in different proportions and different alignments. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would recommend if you're going to do some animal sketching and you're serious about it, get a book that shows where you can look at, say, the skeleton and the musculature and do some realistic style sketches before trying to caricature something new. Um, you know, things like, you know, I don't know, dogs or even maybe birds, uh, you can maybe get away without understanding the anatomy and still do a decent cartoon because they're so familiar with their shapes and their birds especially are fairly simple. Um, here is an actual job I did for a client uh, several years ago. It was for a, a company that uh, produced canine supplements and they wanted a pit bull that was huge, like buff, like really cut, like Arnold Schwarzenegger dog. So I just exaggerated the musculature and the anatomy that was already there, but I tried to make it look as realistic as possible. Uh, so the dog's face isn't necessarily caricatured, but its physique is to make it look more like a strong human. And, you know, I think it's questionable, you know, if a real per, a person who's really familiar with animal anatomy looked at this, they'd probably find a few flaws. But, uh, you know, I, I looked at a lot of that myself. I I, I, like I said, I did look through books to figure out what the anatomy was underneath so I could see what muscles I was indicating. Uh, but when it's a real world application and you're painting it and you see the reference photo and you're trying to manipulate the reference photo to exaggerate it, um, things probably do get lost in translation a little bit. But it's, it was convincing enough, I think. And it was just going to be reproduced on a little pack of dog food supplements. Okay, this other one was for the same company and it's a little weird. Um, oh, wait a second. I'm not, oh shoot, I'm not showing the sketches, am I? Sorry, I never switched over. Okay, I'm gonna start that again. We're gonna pretend this didn't happen. Um, let's see. Thank you guys for letting me know that. I was just going off here. Okay, please. Okay, yeah, that's probably gonna get edited out once this uh, stream is live. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Um, just talking to myself in the camera here. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay, sorry, that must be very boring for you guys. So, just a quick review. Polar bears. Done from life. Try to capture the motion. Great. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, lion sketch. Uh, this was the one I talked about. I think it was a study of another artist's work, but it was so long ago I can't remember. Uh, but I do like the proportions that are in this one. Gorillas. Done from life again. Uh, you know, this one that he's... Yeah, I think this one here where he's screaming, that was probably done from life. He's probably yawning or something. Uh, it's a bit funky. But I do like the more simplistic approach down here. Uh, when, the more simple I go with animals in the, in the construction lines, I'm usually a lot happier than if I try to do a lot of details. At least when I was doing those zoo sketches. Um, because they're so fast. If you try to do something beautiful and indicate all the fur and hair, it's just, it's just not gonna... You don't have time, really, to put into to make that uh, look realistic. Okay, are we... Not yet? It's not... <sighs> Shoot. What is going on here? That's uh... You know, I am actually using a new... Oh, okay. Can you see it now? <laughs> Okay, I'll just wait a second here to make sure I get confirmation from everybody before I start talking like an idiot. I think I figured it out. I'm using I'm using new software today, by the way, to stream this, so it's a little different from what I was used to. I see apes. Yeah, you guys see it now? Okay, yay, we're here. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're just going to pretend that all didn't happen. Uh, anyway, so yeah, here are some of my zoo sketches again. Simple lines, quick gestures, got it, good, okay. Uh, hooved animals, construction lines, simple shapes, uh, just trying to understand the forms. Where is the other ones here today? Yeah, I think, uh, I think I might have closed down some of the other images, but that's all right. Let me go ahead and get rid of that. Get rid of that. Okay, here is uh, that uh, the muscular dog I was talking about. Uh, this company wanted uh, their dog supplements to be represented by this super buff looking pit bull. So I 
again, studied the animal anatomy as best I could and tried to exaggerate it, tried to make it look convincing. Whether I did a good job, I don't know. I'll need a dog expert actually to, to tell me that. Okay. Yeah, Red, uh, it's a habit you're trying to break getting out of the details before getting the large, important shapes first. Oh, I'm so glad you guys can finally see these. Um, all right. Uh, so this one was also for that dog food company, and this particular brand of supplements, they it was had like gorilla in the name, like gorilla supplements for your dog. So they wanted a pit bull with a gorilla's face, and it's horrifying to look at. <laughs> Uh, it gets the point across, though, I guess. Um, but yeah, this was a unique challenge to try to figure out how to blend a gorilla face into a dog's body and also do the buff, you know, exaggerated physique. Um, and I did a couple more for him, but uh, these are like the better ones. Anyway, yeah, so in your own work, you may encounter clients who want you to caricature animals. Um, like I said, it's not a huge specialty of mine, but it's, it is fun to do, and I, uh, I think it's a useful skill to, uh, to have. Uh, thanks, Lester. Uh, Sergen Dirt asks, if you use the Riley method for human caricature, is there any method to draw animals? Rhythms to draw animals. The thing is, though, I don't think Riley himself ever created specific rhythms for animals, but it doesn't really matter. If you're familiar with how to create rhythms, you can make your own rhythms up for anything. All you're trying to do with rhythms is try to find landmarks and important shapes that align with one another, like, say, the the curvature of the lower rear leg maybe lines up with the top of the rib cage in a curving arcing line, and that's a rhythm. But maybe that's only a rhythm for that particular pose. It's not universal. It's not going to translate to another pose or another angle on that animal. Um, rhythm drawing, you know, to draw the construction is just sort of a, it's something you can improvise uh, along the way. So yeah, it's not a, there's no universal single truth. There, there could be, you could invent your own rhythms for animals and publish them and see if they catch on. Uh, since there is an animal method for normal caricatures, we'll use the human method for these. Animal method for normal. I'm not sure I understand the question as far as human method. Anyway, spirit human. Yes, we got to find their spirit human, <laughs> Stan. Actually, that is something I wanted to talk about today when I draw these is uh, when you're drawing animal caricatures, you often do want to find human characteristics. You want to anthropomorphize them a little bit, if, depending on the use, depending on the final purpose. Like if these are actually character designs for a cartoon or an animated show, you definitely want to anthropomorphize the animals and find their spirit human. And it could be based on, you know, maybe the animal's character was an actor or a person through history. Like they want a koala bear that talks like Teddy Roosevelt or looks like Teddy Roosevelt or something. Uh, and that's something you could work into the caricature. So you would definitely want to find that uh, animal's spirit human. So it's, uh, you may have said it jokingly, but it's actually true. Um, one of my main inspirations for animal drawing is a guy who does uh, character designs for animation. His name is David Coleman, C-O-L-M-A-N. I think his uh, website is David's Doodles. And he's amazing. He's so good at all kinds of animals. The, the sketches are just have a beautiful flow and gesture and the anatomy, but they're super uh, caricatured. They sometimes look human. You can view them with human personality traits. Um, I see another one, uh, Aaron Blaze, amazing, of course, famous Disney animator, worked on The Lion King, um, and a bunch of other stuff, and, uh, he specializes, I think, in big cats now, but, I mean, he does all kinds of animals, and he, you know, he does some caricature, a lot of realistic, but, again, he's also a character designer for animated films, so he has the ability to make animals sort of combine with humans in a pleasing way. So there's some good people to look at, Aaron Blaze, I think it's B-L-A-I-S-E, um, I think his website is like Creature Art Teacher or something like that. Anyway, so let's go ahead and get started with drawing. Um, you can still see my drawing page. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I've got here, uh, I just got a random assortment of animals that uh, I'm going to draw from different, you know, all different species. Uh, just to show that it's not, you know, necessarily about being super familiar with the anatomy. It's just about figuring out how to solve a problem on this particular creature and how, what you might do to uh, make it look more interesting, make it look how, like it has some personality. All right, so we've got a couple seagulls here. Uh, Dimrold says, by the way, a lot of Aaron's courses are just one dollar right now on his website. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, definitely check out Aaron's uh, courses. 
All right, so let's see here. I'm just going to start just drawing like what I do with caricatures of humans, just uh, the thumbnail concept sketch, just figuring out the, the gesture and flow of everything. And, I'm, and of course, I'm playing with the proportions, too. So in this one, maybe I'll give him a big head. Uh, let's see. And it's great to look for the rhythms and the, the motion of the actual pose, but if you feel like you can improve it or change it or heighten the drama of the pose, by all means do that. Don't be a slave to the reference photo. Just, you know, the drawing is king. The cartoon, the caricature, whatever you're doing, that's the most important thing. And uh, so, yeah, don't think you have to be too literal with the interpretation of the photo. If you want to change anything, like the head pose, the tilt of anything, the way the weight is distributed, go for it. And whether you want to give them, you know, human eyes or animal eyes, that's up to you, you know, where it's, uh, you know, all black, which most animals almost all have just black eyes. You don't really see, you know, the whites of their eyes. And that can be funny. That can be a cool design choice. Um, or you can make them more human, you know, with the whites around the eyes. Or, you know, add an eyebrow or something to help convey emotion. You'll see that a lot in animation where the human, where the animal characters have uh, more human features like that. Because with animation uh, and storytelling, you have to be able to relate to the characters, so they have to be able to express emotions. And animals aren't really great at that with their own animal anatomy. <laughs> uh, Akanksha says, can you share a link? Oh, someone, uh, Dimralt, if you can share the link in the chat, that's fine. If not, I'll try to do that and add it to the description uh, in the video when I'm done. So see, I'm finding a rhythm right here with uh, the curvature of the neck that flows down into the wing. That's not, you know, on the original, it's, it's, it's not quite perfect like that, but I think on my sketch, it would make more sense to uh, make that one continuous flowing line. And here it's like, it is a rhythm, uh, but if I were to, you know, finish it up, that would just be the contour and that would be the edge of the wing. But they would, uh, when you find things to like line up, uh, it can look uh, a lot stronger graphically. And this one I might do tiny eyes. See, seagulls to me are just kind of like mindless, you know, eating machines. I used to work at SeaWorld and we were just bombarded with seagulls all day long. They were so aggressive. They would always snatch food out of the tourist hands. You know, I was crapped on a few times. Someone, one of the seagulls actually pooped on my artwork that I was drawing at the easel once. Um, that was kind of a funny little moment. I had to start over. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's just these voracious eating machines that'll eat anything. And so that, uh, I think in the, uh, the Finding Nemo film where it had the, uh, the way they characterized the seagulls there really made, uh, it really hit home. I mean, that's, that's, how, that's how I see them. They were just kind of just, you know, mine, mine. See, in human caricature referring some animal face now animal caricature referring what uh yeah i think i just mentioned it a minute ago where you can imbue the animals you're sketching with more human features uh, to make them more relatable but more important than that is this stage of the drawing which is just the gesture the concept you know how you want to break up the forms let's see hey hello shiny uh you haven't, you haven't what? Uh, you say picked up on the, oh, you haven't picked up on the exaggeration yet. I always go too real in the proportions. I usually find I have to draw the person normal first to understand them. Yeah, that's valid. Let's see. 
Yeah, cool. Thanks for joining us from New Zealand. Okay, so again, I'm just getting started here, just getting warmed up. I'm not really ready to commit to like making a finished drawing just yet out of any of these. I'm just going to move on to my next animal. And just, I'm going to keep the variety of animals coming here uh, just to keep me on my toes. I've got a, uh, I don't know, was this a French bulldog? I don't really know the breeds very well. Yeah, let's, uh, let's find the head here. I'll go wide and short. And uh, I think small with the ears. Um, so dog breeds or any animal breeds, you, when you're figuring out what to caricature, what to exaggerate, which direction to go, where to make features big and small, since animals are so different, what do you base it on? You know, with humans, you base your exaggeration decisions off of the statistical average of all faces combined. Uh, with animals, I mean, what do you do there? Well, the way I kind of look at dogs is sort of similar to humans in that there is sort of a average dog or a mutt. Um, I mean, not in that there's greater numbers of one particular type of dog, but when I think of a dog, um, you know, I think of just sort of a Benji type character, you know, Benji the, the dog. Um, and if I were to say draw a Weimaraner or a Chihuahua, I would exaggerate, I would look at how, it, like, say, a Chihuahua differs from that average mutt. And, you know, he has a, you know, a smaller, shorter, you know, lower face with a really pointy little snout and gigantic eyes, you know, as far as a chihuahua goes. Um, and Weimaraner is very long, everything's elongated and tall and um, gangly. So that's, you know, one way to look at it. And another is just to maybe base um, Like, how does this dog relate to a human you might have seen, you know, as far as the proportions? Like, well, his eyes are very wide, uh, far, widely spaced, and the nose is like right up in between the eyes. I could even make it maybe even higher than the eyes, but that's maybe pushing it a bit. I still kind of want my animal caricatures to have a semblance of uh, realistic anatomy. Really long philtrum here. And just a wide gaping mouth with a gigantic tongue hanging out of it, just lolling out of its face. And uh, of course it's a smile, you know, a lot of dogs look like they're smiling from this angle, so definitely want to um, anthropomorphize them a little bit here and uh, play up the smile. I mean, you don't have to, I mean, it's there, it's, you know, just kind of drawing what I see. Uh, Drimralt asks, hey Court, an off-topic question. I do, do BSODs, blue screens of death, still happen? I get this annoying problem now. Yes, um, I used to have it a lot, like in the past year or two. I had to go buy a whole new video card. I couldn't ever figure out exactly what the problem was. Um, the new video card seemed to help the frequency of that, but it didn't stop it entirely. Like it happened once during a stream a couple weeks ago, you may remember. Uh, but it hasn't happened since. Um, but I still get freezing issues where the computer just... You know, I can't do anything, the cursor's frozen, and I just have to do a force restart. Yeah, I don't know. Computers just build up so much junk, you know, and they're on their hard drive over time that there's really no other solution other than just get a new computer, just throw it out. Because by the time, you know, all that gunk builds up and, um, I don't know, conflicting programs and drivers and such, uh, your computer's probably out of date anyway and needs to be replaced, you know, every like four or five years. I think I've had this one probably almost five years. It's actually custom built. A friend came over and helped me uh, build it from scratch based on all the specs that I wanted. And so we're looking down at this dog. We can't really see his hind legs, so it's kind of a weird angle. I don't love drawing pets, especially from above. A lot of people take pictures of their pets looking straight down, and it's just a weird, weird angle. When anyone wants me to do a pet caricature commission for them, I always instruct them to get me photos of them 
that are from the, their own eye level, the pet's eye level, like get the camera down with them and take the picture. Or maybe slightly above, but not looking straight down. It's just, it never translates well in a, uh, in a drawing or a painting when you're looking down on your pet. I mean, look, at, look up at your pet. I mean, it makes them look more majestic and grand anyway. Which is kind of funny for like a tiny animal to make them look majestic and huge. Okay, so here of this guy. Let's see, let's move that down out of the way. Um, so I just did a dog. Let's do, uh, let's do this polar bear. I don't think I'll get through all of my animal photos here today. I've got quite a few. Just wanted to have a lot of variety. Updates in Windows 10. Microsoft started investigating this issue yesterday, and they went to they want people to actually report it in the feedback hub. I don't know. I've had this. I've had blue screen of death for years, uh, so it's not a recent problem for me. Um, yeah, the, all the what do you call it? All the help files or the online discussions of this particular error code most seem to point to video drivers or video cards. Uh, but it still happened after I got a brand new, really, really high rated you know, high capacity video card. So, I don't know, maybe it's just the way the video card talks to the motherboard and processor. I don't know. Okay, let's uh, really focus on the gesture and the weight distribution in the body of this polar bear. So see this, like, teardrop shape. You know, of course, you know, sideways teardrop. And then I think I'll make his head and snout just really small compared to his overall body weight. I think I'll make the arms, the legs a little stubbier too and just wide. Really want to get, give the sense that he's like just a massive bulk. Just draw through the forms as much as you want, I think, in these initial stages so you can get the flow, get the motion. And uh, in the photo here, his, um, his paw is actually on the ice, but I think I'm going to like level off the view and sort of, if I were to draw this with a ground plane, I would think I would raise the paw off the ground just because it feels more dynamic, a little more action. Hello Shiny says, yeah, you always had to coach people on taking good photos. Yeah, you, I, I, I've created like PDF documents uh, that I send in emails that show clients good examples of photos and bad examples of photos. Uh, you know, don't take a picture with a flash. Here's what that looks like. You know, I try to not make it too technical for them, but I still, you, you have to give them a bit of a reason why. Um, you know, tell them, you know, the pictures just, it will turn out better if you follow these guidelines. So uh, maybe shorten the face a little bit, shorten that head. Yeah, it's feeling a little more polar bear-like. Okay, and this bump here is supposed to represent his, I guess it's the scapula. So maybe it does feel a little far forward still. You know, too much into the head area. There we go. Got tiny little ears here. And you can't really see a mouth in the photo. I mean, I guess it's it's there, but I'm just gonna maybe give him a little bit more of a mouth just to make it more human looking, show sort of an expression. And you really wanna show something like this has a lot of weight. So the bottoms of the feet here should be really flat where they're connecting with the ground. 
and the foot that's up in the air should have maybe a little curvature to it, like the paw is curved because there's no weight being laid on it. It's, it's, it's reaching for the ground, but it definitely shouldn't be parallel and flat with the ground like the other feet. This one here, I want to show the compression of the foot hitting the ground. And the one that's up here, just the toe is touching. So there's going to be more curvature in that, uh, in that leg. Yeah, that's true, Shiny. Uh, people think their photos that they have of their pets are just the cutest and most amazing photos, and they're just terrible to work from. You know, if they give you a picture of their dog in, or a cat in, like, a hat in a bow tie and just this costume that's covering up their face, too. I mean, if that's what they want, that's what they want. But I hate that kind of stuff so much. Just animals are fine on their own. Please don't dress them up. And, uh, you know, I haven't really studied polar bear anatomy. I mean, most four-legged animal anatomy is fairly similar. So if you've studied a dog, you will probably be okay, you know, translating that to thing like a bear. Just got it. It's like you're exaggerating the forms of the dog and the musculature that's beneath it. And it's covered by thicker fur, so you can't really see a lot of it anyway. But there definitely are, you know, anatomical indications, you know, you can, which are revealed by the light. I mean, I'm not really doing a study here of the light, but... You know, I'm not doing shadows, but if I were, you know, I, I, I do have a good guide in the photo here as to uh, what, uh, how to shape those contours or how to, you know, indicate those plane changes on the forms of the bear. And there's rim lighting on, you know, the back side and stuff, but I, yeah, I'm not going to do all that. I think at the end, maybe I'll pick one of my sketches and try to refine it a little bit more. Okay, let's keep the, uh, well, polar theme, not the Arctic, because I guess polar bears are from the Arctic and penguins are from the Antarctic, but uh, got this cute little guy here. Uh, can I, Akanksha says, can I share the reference photos or sketches, please? Do you not see them right now? Um, it looks like it's on screen. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what you're asking, Akanksha. Um, because I am, as far as I can tell, everyone can see the photo reference and the sketch. Uh, right. Okay, penguin, just a simple, simple shape here, just like a... An elongated egg and I'm done no <laughs> I'm pretty close though I think having a really tiny you know head up here with this big chunky body is really funny I also want to try to find the actual curvature of the back here. The initial gesture is very um, generalized and generic, but there's actually, you know, a couple bumps in the back here. If I'm, if I'm going more anatomical, you know, a little bit more reference to reality, I want to show, you know, this little change in plane here and this change in plane right there on the reference photo. You know, I can't really see the eye, but I'm guessing it's this where this white little sliver is right there. This is like the tiniest beak I've ever seen on a penguin. Kasim says, two weeks ago, I painted a caricature of an owl. I felt right that you will draw caricatures of animals one day. Thank you, Court. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, let's try this same penguin. I wanted to 
give my client a few different options to choose from. Like this is often part of the process is, you know, just how you might want to change the body shapes to create different uh, concepts of the same character. This will happen a lot actually. So yeah, it's definitely a good practice to get into. And once you've done like a more realistic one, like the first one I think is a little closer to its real realistic proportions, it becomes easier then to branch off and then do, you know, more sillier versions of the same creature, just with uh, vastly different proportions and body shape. I think the little flipper should get a uh, shorter, smaller relative to its body size. This one's so pudgy, maybe has like little uh, cheeks that are pudgy and pushing up on his eye. And then maybe a third one here. kind of looks like this bottle of shampoo that I have. And that actually is uh, something that concept designers often do is they'll find things in their environment and turn them into things like a bottle of shampoo or a, a contraption or a piece of electronics or just anything like a flashlight and they'll work it into the shapes of their concept or character designs. Uh, just basically just find inspiration that they wouldn't have necessarily thought of on their own. Uh, and this wasn't intentional, you know, but it made me think of my bottle of shampoo when I when I uh, drew the shape. And so this is a taller, longer body type, so you're gonna have a longer flipper. I think it might be leaning forward a little too much here, it's a little unbalanced. Watch out for stuff like that too, because this initial stage is about finding the flow of the pose, where the weight is distributed, how it's leaning. And if it's leaning too far forward and looks unbalanced, you know, it looks a little off, so uh, that may not be your intention. If you find it's a problem and you don't want to redraw it, just, uh, you know, rotate. So, one photo reference, three very different results. Um, yeah, I still kind of like the first one, just because that was my first instinct, I guess. But that's how you might elaborate on a concept. Um, okay, here's a fun one. This is the most human-like animal you're going to get is a, uh, a great ape, a monkey or an ape. The easiest kind of animal to anthropomorphize. Okay, let's find the overall sweep of the forms here. It's not a whole body, it's just, you know, the head but I still want to find just the big shapes first, the abstract shapes that are at play here. I really love this angle too on this, uh, on this grill. It's very dynamic, a lot of diagonals.
Heimdall asks, would you say it's easy to draw a young versus an old animal? No, I mean, I don't, I don't, I've never noticed a distinction, because honestly, I don't know if I could tell an animal's age. Uh, with some, you might be able to, just if they look really haggard, or an ape, maybe, you might be able to tell. Um, I mean, I think in general, maybe age, or the signs of age, are, they do give the caricaturist and the artist more fuel. So maybe an older animal, but, you know, a young animal, too, is, has such cute features and properties, like a, like a kitten or a puppy is definitely, well, I'm going to say definitely, but I think it has more appeal to most people than an adult dog or cat. Because it has, you know, we can give it sort of human baby proportions and features. So there are, there are I think, pros, you know, to both sides, to young and old animals. really really sunken in uh, eyes underneath a massive brow ridge and because it's so similar to humans you can definitely feel I think the difference here between like something like this and a you know and a penguin uh, as far as being able to imbue it with uh, human characteristics there's just so many more opportunities here but with facial expression and body type because this looks like sort of a big hulking guy it looks like a bodybuilder or maybe a bodybuilder who's also kind of you know heavy you know heavy set as well He's almost got like this angry expression. So that can be reflected in the brow ridge as well. Shiny says, Court, if people draw along with your tutorials, do you like it if we tag you on Facebook or Instagram? Some people really like tagging and some not so keen. Oh, yeah, I don't mind if you tag me. Yeah, that's, you know, you want, want me to see what you did. Totally. I mean, I, it's kind of fun actually to see, you know, the fruits of my labors, you know, as far as what I'm, in, you know, inspiring people to create. That's always actually a good thing. It's sort of like feedback. You drew along last week with the Pat Morita sketch, uh, though you didn't draw the version I drew. Um, you drew, you drew a more boring one. That's all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think I did see that. Um, I don't know where I, if I saw it on Instagram or where I saw it, but yeah, yeah, I think it was, uh, uh, I see, I remember what you're talking about. It was good. The expression here, I mean, there's... You know, you can definitely push it if you want. You can make them more grumpy looking. Um, I might try that and see how I like it. Maybe make it more of a pouty or a grumpy face. Yeah, it, it's not really reading so grumpy right now. It's just almost sort of a neutral expression. You know, pretty human-like ears too, so I basically just draw that human-shaped ear with a few changes. Anyway, so yeah, there's my gorilla, sort of card, <clears throat> almost an animated character design style, mostly because of its simplicity. If I want to uh, add some fur and more realistic anatomy, it might more go <clears throat> more into the realm of uh, you know an illustrated animal caricature. You're having difficulty seeing the eyes in the reference photo? Oh well, yeah, it's probably pretty small on your screen, but uh, there you go, a little bigger for you. Oops. There we go. 
Yeah, really, really tiny eyes and set deep, deep into these sockets. In fact, I might, now that I'm looking at it a little more closely, I might in the sketch even add a little bit of uh, shading, some real darkness in there. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to our next animal. Okay, here's a challenge I thought I'd give myself. Let's try to make a caricature of this guy. One of the least human things you could possibly find. Except for maybe like, I don't know, a sponge or a piece of coral. All right, so, but it does have mass. It does have rhythms and flowing gesture lines. Uh, and it has eyes, and it has a head, and it has what we can co sort of construe as a face. So I'm going to go off that and try to anthropomorphize this a little bit. And I might have some liberties here with the, uh, with the tentacles, just because... Uh, you know, some of them are at sort of odd angles, and they don't wouldn't necessarily read as well in a uh, in a drawing. And this one, because he is so non-human, I think I will go with the cartoony human eyes. Give him sort of a derpy look with the eyes uh, sort of wall-eyed. I'm pretty sure octopuses have like a sort of a beak in inside uh, their underneath the tentacle area, right? So if, if that's the case, I think since the case, maybe I'll give them a little bird beak here. Although I don't, I think that might just be squid that have that. I'd have to look into that. That's where knowing octopus anatomy might actually be more helpful. <laughs> But until I find out, I'll just keep the beak. He has a little goofy smile. Stuff like this I really prefer to draw with pencil on paper because I feel like I have more control um, over just the lines that I'm doing. It's a little harder to maintain control over a long distance when working with a stylus on a tablet. That's just personal preference though. Five, so he needs eight. Uh, let's see, I kind of like this one that's all curled up. There we go. So that's six. Have a little more overlapping of the forms too, that uh, make it look a little more convincing. Seven, and let's see, there's this one long one over here. Uh, Red says, from what I read some years ago, I think the beak is the only really solid part of the octopus. Okay, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I thought they had a beak, but I wasn't sure. Okay, and on some of these, I'm sure we would see the little suckers on the bottom. So like this one here. 
I'll just give a few indications of that. Uh, maybe this one here too, a little bit. And maybe a little bit. This one you might see some of the little suckers. And this one. But just a, again, it's just a rough gesture sketch. So cartooning or caricaturing an octopus. That's my first attempt. <laughs> okay, let's get back to more familiar territory here. We got a uh, doggy. I think this is a, uh, it's an Italian greyhound, if I'm not mistaken. Could be wrong. Okay, this kind of dog though is super awesome for caricature. He's just, he's so unique and different. Very distinctive shapes. And once you've drawn a few dogs, it's just, it's great to get a dog like this. Just that is so different from other types of dog shapes. I mean, long neck, so I'll make the neck longer. The head, I think, has generally a you know, wider skull or wider cranium where the, where the eyes fit in, a little flatter on the top. Kind of a big nose still. Dogs always, to me, sort of have a sort of a dumb, blank look on their face. They're just always happy to be wherever they're at. So it's either mild surprise or happiness or just blank. <laughs> I think the blank expression is, is my favorite just because it makes them look sort of dull, like dull and vac vacuous. Feel like they're a little more, a little more sinister and sly. And those are definitely, you know, just personality traits we ascribe to them. I don't think they're really sinister. But, um, you know, they lend themselves to that with just their body language and the shapes of their faces. Hi, Rodolfo. Thanks for joining. So a little bit of his little doggy smile is visible there on this side. Yeah, right. So yeah, not really gonna do shading or anything unless I decide to move this one to a finish, but uh, just throwing in a little bit of an anatomical, some anatomical forms in here. That is a funny dog. Almost looks like a rat. <laughs> Okay. Ooh, another, I just got a bird here. Rooster, I guess. Let's see about this guy. And it's a full body shot too, so that's good. With birds, I think the whole body is very helpful to have. This initial sketch, I try to, keep, try to keep that pencil moving, just keep it in constant motion so that you start to feel the flow and the rhythms. So 
can only see the front leg, can't really see the back, but I think I'll throw in a few of his chicken toes in the back there just to show that it's not a one-legged chicken. Talk about sort of blank expressions though, like I did with the dog. I mean, roosters, chickens, and most birds are just, you know, they've got cute body language a lot of the times, but yeah, their faces are just these blank slates. The coxcomb, I think it's called up here. Yeah, not a super exaggeration. I'm a pretty, very similar to like its actual body type. So this is another one I might try to figure out what more, you know, a different way to exaggerate them. I think this foot is unbalanced. It needs to go a little further back here. There we go. Yeah, let's try this guy again. I'll keep this one visible, but let me just shrink them down. Try to come up with a different body type for this guy. Let's make, maybe make this one more about the neck and the head than about the body. Maybe smaller feet. bigger coxcomb on top of his head. Rar Alex says, I think it's difficult to make caricatures of animals. You have to think of their behavior rather than their appearance. So true, yeah. Um, that's what really makes animal caricatures and cartoon drawings of animals stand out is the attitude you give them, the, the personality, um, and, you know, it's sort of the human personality we're ascribing to them based on their appearance and how they think, make us think of a certain type of person, maybe, that is exhibiting similar traits. There we go, two, two variations on the same bird. Just show how I might change up the concept and create different shapes. Okay, so it's about one o'clock. Yeah, I can do probably a couple more here. Let's get a, oh, here's a real different one. Frog, I love. And I don't know if I've ever actually tried caricaturing one now that I think of it. Again, the whole body comes into play here. It's this sort of, I don't know, diamond-shaped body. And we're going to see maybe smaller legs and feet to make the body look bigger. I don't know why. It's just an instinct. And they've got these great Popeye forearms where the forearms look a lot bulkier and meatier than, the, uh, than their upper arms. So these huge bulbous eyes coming off his head, so 
I think that's an obvious choice for something to make really large. And that works really well for animated characters too, just having large eyes that are very expressive. Anytime you can get away with large eyes on a character design, I think that's a, a, good, a good, uh, good thing to do. I think the back, yeah, the back toes are webbed, but the front ones are not. That's what that looks like. And frog eyes, you know, again, with any character, it's, it's just up to you as far as the style of eye that you want to give them. There's no one right answer. If you can give them animal eyes, you can give them human eyes. If it's, you know, again, if it's a character for an animated film and it's a main character, you probably want to give them human style eyes. Uh, but maybe if it's a background character or, uh, or just a style of animation where it's going to be a little more realistic, just go full frog. Just a few, a few weird froggy details here. Oh, he's also got a little bit of a snout, or a little bit of a nose here, little nostrils. Just have a little bump for that. Ernie, er, Emery says, I think animal cartoons are easier than drawing humans. Yeah, well, that, that's good. Maybe that's something you can specialize in. Okay. I feel like I could definitely do more of a cartoony version of that, a more exaggerated in different ways. Yeah, let me try this on the frog too, because I feel like the first one is often the safer drawing. It's the one that's a little closer to the actual uh, animal, because I'm a little timid to try to change things uh, in the initial sketch. So let's try that one more time. Like with the rooster, I think I'm going to change the proportions, maybe focus more on the head on this one. Make them all about the head and the mouth and the eyes. Basically a head with legs. I should keep that other frog visible, I guess. Because the angle that acts that I actually should probably move up over about there. No, that doesn't look quite. I think that I mean it is how it looks in the photo, but yeah, no, I think the eye needs to go further back. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's better.
So this thumbnail sketch phase, remember, is just it's about exploring, and you know, it's it's the fun stage. It's where you can really, uh, you know, have fun with the shapes, and you don't have to be so concerned about anatomy or contours or fur or anatomy, anything like that. It's just this is just exploring the shapes. Would be cool. Let's see, Coco Vid says, "Would be cool to see a dynamic caricature of a frog." I can imagine drawing it leaping from midair. Yeah, I'd um, i probably want a photo reference on that myself because I'm not super familiar with frog anatomy just right now. Um, but who is really amazing at doing stuff like that um, is David Coleman. I was just you know checking out his work, uh, getting ready for this. He has a bunch of sketches of like a turtle doing a lot of dynamic poses, and it's amazing the range of motion and action that he gets out of a turtle with a shell which you think of as being hard and immovable, but you know, it'll flex a little bit in his drawings to serve the action. Okay, got more birds here. There's a dog already to draw. I haven't done a rhino, let's see. What other animals do I have here? I'll just do like one more thumbnail sketch and then I'll pick one of these to draw from. Yeah, I guess I'll do the rhino. Make them a little bigger. Uh, Red asks, would the abstraction stage be applicable to animals? Definitely. Um, I'm not sure if you caught it. I mentioned it in the beginning, I think when I was having the trouble with all my, uh, with sharing my screen. But um, um, yeah, the uh, abstraction, you can make the abstraction out of anything, uh, applied to any subject, and it'll change based on whatever animal you're looking at. Um, you can make your own abstractions, your own rhythm lines. It's, uh, there's no rules really when it comes to that. It's just whatever helps you in the moment. Okay, now talk about m mass and bulk here. Like this, rhinos always make me think of like, they're like the tanks of the animal world. They're just heavily armored, a lot of folds of skin, this great amount of just bulkiness. They're like the elephant unicorns of the animal world, maybe too. <laughs> I don't know. So, kind of like with the polar bear idea, I'm going to make them, give them stubbier, fatter legs, I think. To show that, you know, the legs have to be uh, heavier, sturdier, if they're going to support such a larger looking beast. Uh, yeah, Emery, if you want to share any uh, drawings you have, just tag me on uh, Facebook or on Instagram, and I'll uh, try to take a look at them. Uh, my Instagram is at uh, Court Jones Artist. I'm running out of a little bit of room here on my rhino. There we go. The head feels a little more balanced and it's getting a little short for the body type. There actually is a second horn right there that now fits in the place of where the second horn should be. What an un interesting looking head too. It's such got like this weird concave uh, skull forehead up here before you even get to the ears which are up here. Let's see if I can get a closer look at this guy's uh, face and his mouth. Okay, there's his mouth here. Got sort of a rounded off snout. Almost like he has like a sunken in upper lip. If he was a person, you know, he wouldn't have much of an upper lip at all. It's like the bottom lip protrudes, I think, more than the upper lip. So yeah, just looking for those human connections that help me think about how I can exaggerate it. Which is so important with animals that are so different from us. I 
other leg I think is hidden behind the uh, front leg, so I'll just indicate it simply there and just leave it behind the front one. Okay, that eye is just below and behind the uh, second horn, which is about right there. It's got sort of a lazy eye, it looks to me, like very like heavy-lidded, kind of half-closed. So he's happy eating his hay. Okay, so again, just a gesture. I'm not really trying to do an anatomical study here. I'm just trying to figure out if I want to take this one further. Let's see. All right, let's now review the sketches that I have done and see which one of them might be good candidates. Rar Alex says, the only problem I see with animal caricatures is that so many people already have done it and only your style will make it unique. And, you know, that's true for any kind of art, I think. It's your style that is what sets you apart from other artists. Because uh, everything's been drawn, everything's been painted in life. <laughs> uh, I got the frog, my two frogs here. Okay. My rooster. Oh, that the guy, I love that guy. Octopus. Pretty interesting, but not necessarily that interested in refining it right now. Gorilla uh, definitely has a lot of promise. Uh, I always love drawing apes and primates. They're just, because they're so like us, I think they're really fun to, to draw. Penguin, yeah, I had fun with those shapes, but I think uh, we'll move on. Polar bear. Frenchie. That one wasn't quite as uh, resolved as I would have liked, I think. I need to spend a little more time on that. And there's the initial seagulls. I really like the seagull on the right here. Let's see. So I think I will... See, I do like that polar bear. Um, let's see here. Let's get him on screen. Gorilla. Oh yeah, this... Italian Greyhound, I think. Oops. Oh, the rooster was really fun, too. I really like how that second rooster came out. He had a lot of cool dynamic qualities. Yeah, I like it, the second rooster better than the first one. But let me hide him real quick while I look at some other ones. Frog. Frog. And Rhino. Yeah, I think it's down between... Um, these three, as far as my own personal favorites. Do you guys have a preference? While you're thinking about that, I'll uh, see if I can get that photo reference back.
And there it is. Love the dog, the gorilla, the dog. Okay, a couple for the dog, three for the dog. <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you, Shiny. Yeah, I think we'll go with the dog. Um, that seems to be the most votes right now. So let me move this on over here. Make them just a little bigger. Okay, and what I usually like to do is just dim down the uh, original sketch layer and redraw on top of it. Okay, so I'm just trying to stick to my initial shapes, but I'm just going to refine them a little bit more and think more about the anatomy now. I didn't really show it in the thumbnail sketch, but there is a bit of a mouth underneath the nose here, too. So I'll be sure to include that here. And got a little bottom lip here. Very flat though. I don't want to interrupt the overall silhouette of the shape that I had created. I'm just adding a little bit more correct concept within that shape. And I'm paying a little more attention to the actual contours of the dog's face now too. And the, like the in, uh, form inserts into another form and plane change occurs. Like here, there's like this whole section for the, uh, the eye socket where it intersects with the snout is a very important plane change, I think. Move the eye over just a little bit to conform with that anatomy. Then his little cheekbones here. Also doing, you know, just a bit of measuring here. It looks like, yeah, I think I need to add a little bit more um, width to the head on the right side here. It's a little short. The head is turned away from us so that we do, we should see actually more of the face on the left side, but uh, I think I need to extend this a little more to make the measurements more 
uh, symmetrical. What I might have done if I was being a little slower and more careful is flip the, uh, the rough sketch or flip the concept sketch to see if I could find any bad alignments, but I think I caught that as I was drawing it here. Uh, Bruno asks, hey, Mr. Jones, call me Court, by the way, uh, thinking of a specific animal, isn't it important to know its own personality described by owners in several photos? I think the owners already have a personification of their pets. Uh, yeah, uh, always get as much information you can from the owners about what they think about their own pet and try to play up those characteristics. I, I've, I always try to do that if I get a chance to talk to the client. Um, you have to say, hey, is this dog a very enthusiastic dog with a lot of energy or is it very mellow or is it hyper, you know, just try to figure that out and that will help you not only choose the right reference photo if they give you a bunch of reference photos, but once you're actually working from the reference, you can try to yeah, add those characteristics in. Yeah, that's a good point. When you don't know, when you don't have, don't have that information, you just kind of have to guess. Uh, like if you're making your own characters for a project or an illustration, you can just assign it whatever characteristics you want, but yeah, uh, try to get the owner's input. Uh, yeah, Shiny, that's another um, way to go, too, if you don't want to know anything about the animal or the person. But when doing a commission for someone where it's, you know, you know something that they have a very strong opinions about how that animal behaves, um, I mean, they'll, they'll probably give you the reference photos that do embody that, that animal's personality. Uh, but if they don't, I mean, I think it's a good idea to actually try to ask. Um, because with commissions, you know, you don't want to sort of get it wrong and have them kind of be not quite happy with it because they, you know, it doesn't quite look like their baby and they don't know why. <laughs> What is important on pet characters in particular is make sure you get their coloring right. Uh, you know, where, where they have spots and stuff, that's, because uh, that's just like, you know, if it, that's a physical trait you just got to do if you're going to, if you're going for a likeness on an animal.
getting in gender is important too with human animals. Yes, with human animals, definitely. <laughs> A lot of people don't think about dogs as having whiskers, uh, but they do. I mean, you don't need to play them up as much as you might on a cat, but um, I think it's a fun little detail to include. Okay, now I might add just a little bit of, um, you know, shading with a proper brush, just a like kind of a little charcoal-y type brush. Let's see here. It's just a little faster than cross hatching if you want to get cover a large area at once. I usually like to lay down a flat tone as evenly as I can and then uh, get some darker shadows in there. Let me know if you have any more questions as we're wrapping things up here. Bruno asks, uh, people in general want just a caricature or something anthropomorphic? Um, you know, I think just, um, I, yeah, that's a tough one. You know, everyone has, comes with different expectations. I don't think people, well, <laughs> people do anthropomorphize their pets. They always assign them. Feeling. So I think they're going to expect to see certain personality traits in a commission you might do. Uh, but um, don't treat animal, you know, portrait commissions or caricature commissions the same way you would as a uh, animated concept design for a, like say a film with starring animals. Uh, that's definitely a, two different purposes of animal drawing. It's not, they're not the same. Um, so don't anthropomorphize as much as you might do if it's going to be a character for a movie project or something or a comic book. Unless that's your thing, you know, maybe if that's a style you want to develop and, you know, make pet portraits that look like animated characters that have personality. That could be a legitimate, like, uh, service you offer and people will come to you because you do that. So if you like doing it, just do what you like and then the, the right client will find you. Just put that work out there that you do that you want to do more of. And, yeah, the right client will find you. Let's add a little bit more light shapes back in there now. I was going dark for a while, now I can um, select white as my color. Or I could have used the eraser, but I think I'm just going to do white shading rather than erasing. Okay, let's see. Any last minute things here? Um, thanks, Dan. Uh, Shiny says lots of photos though in live too. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Those are just the last few things that were already posted. All right, well, thank you guys so much for joining me. And I'm real sorry about the technical problems at the beginning. I don't think I've had a stream yet where there hasn't had at least one little thing go wrong. Today was a big thing, but um, 
Uh, maybe I'll edit that out so no one will know. Um, but uh, yeah, I was using some new streaming software today. I was trying it out and I didn't do everything properly there. Um, but anyway, yeah, if you, um, if you can, throw a like on the video on the, uh, on the YouTube page here and let me know if you have any additional questions in the comments. And uh, thank you all again for joining me. I'll see you probably in about another week, I guess. Seems to be what we're doing here is one week apart. So, uh, all right. Take care.